mass produce a high performance mechanical sensor and low cost. So, right, I mean, initially we tried to use clean room, but again, clean room could be expensive still. And uh, if you could use printing or some other low cost manufacturing approach, this would be very attractive for low cost disposable sensors. Recently, we proposed to use the laser engraving to fabricate the microfluid multi model sensor page for you know, skin interface, the multi model analysis. In this case, we're using laser to grab your pen. You know, CO2 laser can directly patent the red pen on the surface of polyimide. Because of photothermal process, basically, the laser will carbonize the surface of polyimide, basically, burning the polyimide to create a red You can program the laser parameter to control the morphology and also the property of red pen. Some type of red pen composite essentially is a red pen graphite composite. You can control the Structure to make sure they are suitable for chemical sensors, have good high, you know, high like chemical pilot activity. We can use for sweat analysis. We could also program or design the sensor, graphene based physical sensor, to monitor vital signs such as temperature, respiration, and heart rate. And laser can also be used to patent microfluidics on the skin because you know what? The sweat analysis, you want to make sure when you sweat come out, it will push away the worst sweat. You always get it. Analyzing the new sweat. And also, very importantly, if you do things in the microfluidics, you have miniaturized influence from sweat and vibration. You get real time information and you get on time information or on concentrated information. In this case, more accurate information from microfluidics. Overall, this multi model microfluidics sensor patch can be entirely prepared using laser with you know, plastic specific. This large scale will cost. And our graduate student, Isabella, because this work received the bonus 30 on the 30 signs at her age of 25. So, this laser in graduate graphene has very good performance in chemical sensors. As you can see here, they have much better performance compared to glass carbon, gold, and certain TD lectures. These are commercially available. And if we directly do sweat or saliva analysis, you can see in the differential pulse of the time trip, you can see oxidation peaks. Of there are two oxidation peaks. The first one belongs to uric acid. The second one belongs mainly to called pyrosin. So oxidation peak height from this curve actually corresponding to the target concentration. Based on this, we can directly analyze some electric molecules such as uric acid and pyrosin using this laser in very different But other electrons, you don't really see very good peaks. And this is a good chemical sensing performance. This laser for the graphene sensor can be used for physical sensing. We design a temperature sensor, you know, when you increase the temperature, resistance of this graphene sensor decrease. Different from the metal. Metal when you increase temperature, you know, resistance increase, but the current structure, the current material increase. And we can also design a strength sensor to monitor respiration and heart rate. And because this, uh, this structure is 3D, you know, some people may think, oh, this could be flaky. Not very stable this structure, which is not true. If you design a parameter properly, uh, when you do the laser cutting, this structure is quite robust technically. We can, you know, do repetitive bending here, and sound cycles, we don't see any substantial resistance change. This microfluidity, as I said, is very important to make sure we can get a high temperature solution. You know, we don't want to analyze the mixed sweat, we always want to analyze the fresh sweat. So when new sweat come out, we design this multi-inlet microfluidics, it can push away the worst sweat at a refreshing rate of roughly two to three minutes based on the physiological sweat rate. So we try the flow test, you see on the same flow rate, if you do irrigated carbon sensing for 15 minutes, you get the same performance. I mean, the sensors are pretty stable. If you change concentration for your density, you know, from low to high, you take two minutes roughly to reach the new stable reading. That means the temperature resolution is pretty good. So not only laser engraving we can use to fabricate, uh, you know, low cost uh, disposable sensor patch. We could also use other printing technologies such as inkjet printing. So we have this uh, uh, inkjet printer in the lab. We can custom develop, develop a different type of inks. So in this case, we can design nano engineered wearable sensor or electronic skin copier using custom developed inks. If you want to detect uh, target A, target B, maybe different nano material can you know, different performance. Right? You want to choose the best material or optimize material for this specific type of sensing. So we could print it, you see here, silver, carbon, gold, carbon, uh, 
vacuum duct decorated with graphene oxide and similar wire, most encapsulation layer, mixing, many other material we could do. And uh, most of the inks are prepared in our own lab. So in this work, not about sweat sensing, this work we showed, you know, we can detect different type of hardware chemicals. We can also print the EMT electrode use for robotic or remote things with the chemical sense as well. So, but as you can imagine, this technology can be readily, readily adapt to the model work on sweat sensing as well. Another important aspect is that we are doing sweat sensing. Many people will have questions because, you know, not all the time I'm sweating a lot. Maybe I don't have enough sweat at this moment, even I can still say I'm sweating, but very little or not. So usually you need a vigorous exercise to get enough sweat. But you know, not everyone will get sweat even when they do exercise. And for many patients, for clinical studies, we cannot even ask our patients to exercise to come running to get a sweat to get this kind of monitoring thing. So we have to address this issue. How can we get sweat beyond physical exercise? Can we monitor our sweat while we are sleeping? Can we realize 24 7 continuous monitor things? We have to address this problem in this case. So, through literature search, we found that you know, there are the process, uh, forensics, this technology can be used to locally induce sweat. So, in this case, using a small equipment, you, know, you can apply current roughly one milliamp. You deliver a drug, you already have a carbon, you know, chemical setting. Uh, this drug molecules will stimulate the sweat gland to trigger the local sweat. This is the standard sweat test process used in a clinical setting for diagnosing cystic fibrosis, which is like a lung disease. Um, but the process, you know, several minutes I'm a fibrosis, you use this tool to collect sweat for one hour. The doctors, you know, send out a sample for laboratory test. This is how clinically. We use this type of technology. Inspired by this, um, back in 2017, we published our first paper on this. And this year, we have a much more advanced version. So, we developed a wearable platform that can perform autonomous sweat extraction on demand. So, whenever we want to do sweat analysis, we just need to control from the cell phone, you know, sweat simulation starts. And in this case, we design in a way we only need to apply 50 micro very small current for several minutes, let's up to five minutes. And you only need to do this few minutes, very small current estimation. You will get a continuous sweat only from this small area, at least for four or five hours. It could be for two days as well, depending subject, depending how much dose we want to put, right? But uh, mind that, you know, we can easily restart the process. And all you need to do is click button from itself. So this sweat can be efficiently induced from this small area, and you don't really feel anything. The current is so small, the micro anti current also only a few minutes current. And uh, all other times, so sweat continues to come out. We still don't feel anything, but our sensor can continuously analyze this newly created sweat. I show some video. We use a black dye to, uh, lay, uh, to let you see clearly how this sweat comes out. You see the black dye get dog, and the sweat is from the gland that push out this black dye. Now in the reservoir, if black dye become cleaner and cleaner, they come out as well outlet. The sensor is inside the middle reservoir. From another subject, you see the black dye quickly get dissolved by the sweat and get pushed out by sweat. There's no pump. It's sweat landed now as a part of pump. So this entire process is autonomous. So our lab, you know, we realize the issue, you know, we address the issue how to access sweat across activities. And our lab always develop a system as well. Uh, we don't want to only develop a sensor pack, kind of this is a wearable sensor. We want to make sure we develop an audio device that can provide us reliable data. Because data is the most important thing for wearable technology, right? If you cannot get reliable data, it's not a really uh, I mean, good or working wearable technology. So we have different prototypes, and we can follow a sensor like a patch, like different body parts. This time, we have a, work, uh, like a watch version, uh, band version, you know, they can be used to wirelessly and continuously collect the data from our body. And we have different type of app right now to give you different type of data analysis uh, capability. So, from this slide, I will briefly show you some applications of this wearable sensing. So firstly, disease diagnosis. We could use this sweat sensor for disease diagnosis. 
clinically, as I said earlier, cystic fibrosis is a genetic lung disease. The gold standard for CF diagnosis is by some sweat color. So using the approach I mentioned earlier, either pharmacies using the equipment, so they collect the sweat in one or two hours, then send out the lab to get a lab to wait one week to get them without about sweat color, which is the standard for CF diagnosis. Instead of waiting one week, you know, we can apply our wearable system to induce sweat and analyze the sweat sodium chloride. And in collaboration with the Stanford School of Medicine, in this case, Cystic Fibrosis Center at Stanford. So we apply our technology on healthy people and on sick patients. You see that within 20, 25 minutes, you get a stable reading of sweat sodium chloride, of not induced sweat. And uh, look at statistical value, you know, the patients are much higher sweat sodium and chloride compared to healthy people. <clears throat> we can say that from here, you know, uh, basically, for ADA, the diagnosis of CF is based on sweat chloride higher than 16 years old for uh, children higher than 40. But from here, we can say that our technology can be used for screening and diagnosis of cystic fibrosis. So, the next uh, important application we have been working on is look at metabolic disorders. So, here I give my specific example, specific example is gout. The gut is the, the most common inflammatory, uh, uh, inflammatory arthritis affecting tens of millions of people around the world. My brother has gout as well. So, gut is characterized by heart uricemia. Basically, uric acid is the biomarker of gout. So, the, bio, uh, the uric acid is, uh, level is so high that crystallizes near the joint. You see, there are tremendous pain for the patients. But the patients, they cannot eat too much red meat, shellfish. Or beer because it contains a high amount of pure. The, the pure uh, uric acid is a, you know, a pure metabolite. So in this case, for healthy people, you know, gout patients, people develop gout is either because of the genetic reason or because of the lifestyle. So for healthy people, it's very important to monitor uric acid. You need to try the chance for developing gout. For gout patients, it's very important to. Uh, for them to, to monitor this to avoid the initial chance for getting gut attack. And for gut patients with uh, urate lowering therapy, they need medications such as allopurinol to lower uric acid level. It is also important to monitor uric acid personalized the drug dose. And finally, uh, you know, uric acid is also a key risk factor for renal diseases, type 2 diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. We apply our microfluidic uric sensor patch on healthy people with male subject, female subject. After overnight fasting, we see very low level of uric acid in both blood and the sweat after the texture rich diet. Both you know, sweat and serum uric acid levels increase. And in collaboration with UCLA Medical Center, uh, our main collaborator, Dr. Dr. Lee, the chief of clinical nutrition at UCLA. So we recruited a patient with gout, and the subject with hobby with senior, uh, we compare this with the healthy people. You see that for the gout patients, they are much higher uric acid level compared to healthy people. And if we track one subject for seven hours, we see that sweat uric acid follow closely the blood one. If we plot the data together, we get a high correlation factor between sweat and the serum uric acid, 0.864. Pretty good already because this is without any personalized calibration. Just simply put it in a computer. It's already very good. And as you can imagine, with further study and calibration mechanism, we can get much higher expect correlation factors. And the new outcome paper, we are applying our wearable technology to monitor a number of other circulating metabolites and nutrients, which include every single type of essential amino acids for them. So another important application we can use wearables to perform therapeutic drug monitoring. TDM is a very important approach you know, to realize drug personalization. Right now, you know, we talk about precision medicine, talk about personalized medicine. The physician will want to tailor the dose of the drug according to the patient because everyone responds very differently to the same dose of drug. So for many drugs, there are very narrow therapeutic <coughs> window. Therapeutic window, you know, when the drug level is too high, it's like surgery. When the drug level is too low, you don't get enough treatment. 
That's why I feel we want the drug level to remain in this green therapeutic window. But for many drugs, their therapeutic window is very narrow, very hard to maintain. You have to concentrate into your blood with several days to get this point of blood drug level. And drug level, you know, change all the time. So it's not easy to perform these you know, pharmacokinetics or pharmacodynamic studies using current uh, blood based TDM approaches. But you know, drug is a substance, mostly small molecules. They're very easy to diffuse throughout the sweat blood, and they're very correlated to the correlation between sweat and blood. Work. If we could monitor this through the skin, you know, the physician can get information remotely, uh, and uh, I mean, it's very hard to realize the drug personalization. And another very important factor is many patients always forget to take medication. This will also be a very useful tool, you know, to improve drug adherence. So. Before we found a good clinical collaborator, we picked a very simple drug. I mean, have either drug, right? And it's very easy for us to do human study. We just give a dose out, give it a bit, okay, one shot, two shots, three shots. <laughs> you know, like, let, let's see the drink different shot coffee, you get a different le level of caffeine in this way. And uh, we can detect caffeine using differential power or temperature because caffeine is an electroactive molecule. You can find oxygen peak at around 1.4 and using this approach, we can dynamically monitor caffeine level in your body. After you drink coffee, in the first hour, the caffeine level increases and reach the peak of one hour. So that starts to decrease, which is very close to the trend in blood. This is just one example. Right now, we have been working on multiple cancer drugs to realize drug personalization. We have recruited over 50 patients already in collaboration with the city of Hope National. Uh, cancer so one of, another uh, important uh, key application is using uh, wearables to perform, use sweat center to perform stress and mental health monitoring. You know, 90% or 95% of stress, we have different data, but overall they're high. Many diseases that are stress related, including you know, anxiety, depression, PTSD, cardiovascular disease, and cancers. Even stress is so important. Stress, there is no good way to quantify stress. Mostly right now, based on the questionnaire, can write it. Based on your answer, a score generated. This could be very subjective. Or similarly, depression in the same way. You know, people use the GHQ line for example, this questionnaire to, to diagnose or quantify depression. Suicide is the same. <coughs> if one person wants to commit to suicide, will this person tell the truth? Even you give this person a questionnaire. That's why we want to. Get a, a device, a technology that can be used to quantify stress. So we're looking at a stress biomarker. One of the most well-known stress biomarker is cortisol. But if you, you know, people try to look at blood cortisol, blood cortisol is effective, but it's hard to do because when you try to draw blood, you are giving stress to your subject. But your purpose is to monitor stress. You know, this is problematic by itself. That's why. Non invasive cortisol monitoring would be very important. We are looking at uh, sweat cortisol in this case. We developed uh, this cortisol sensor based on laser in where the breath in. It's immunosensor, not really for continuous monitoring, but it uh, works very efficiently. It can only take, you know, it only takes around one minute to one and a half minute to get accurate cortisol analysis in sweat. And uh, we need a sweat cortisol analysis, saliva cortisol analysis, and compare this to blood. They have very similar pattern. You see, morning cortisol is higher in the afternoon. We get a good correlation between sweat and the blood cortisol level. And we also see circadian reason of the sweat cortisol. And uh, to further evaluate, uh, you know, we can, we can really track stress response. We design a human study, give our subject a student more stress. Basically, by asking them to do vigorous exercise, they increase stress by you know, the COVID pressure test is another stressor. If you put uh, your hand into ice water, you will feel a lot of pain and a lot of stress. And uh, we can quickly capture the increase in so, uh, sweat cortisol. So we try to adapt this technology for COVID-19 diagnosis as well. This is not a sweat test, but you know, using a similar immunobest uh, laser in reference sensor platform, we developed uh, SARS CoV-2 rapid test. Which is a most useful for our best telemedicine platform. They can simultaneously monitor virus antigen, virus antibody, and the inflammatory biomarkers from our saliva and blood within minutes. 
Why do we need multiplex density? We need to manage to get three different aspects of infection. The way that we are currently infecting from that. How is our immunity information? Uh, how your vaccine stages and you get COVID before, you know, and how severe the infection is. All three aspects of infect information within 10 minutes. And this, you know, you, you can wirelessly get it quantitative data in this case. We compare the, I mean, it's check the selectivity over SARS and MERS. We try to evaluate <coughs> the COVID positive and COVID negative sample. But we can successfully distinguish all the positive samples from negative samples we have tested. And uh, uh, the last piece of my talk, I'll make it very brief because I gave a, a talk about energy harvesting two days ago uh, in this conference. And right now we're using Eastern Bakery as a power source, but we could harvest energy from the body and from the environment, which is a promising future for future like a wearables, how to power them. Since we are doing sweat sensor with about technology that can harvest energy from human sweat using fission of biofuel In this case, we demonstrated it for the first time. The battery free system entirely powered by human sweat. And they can still perform multiplex biosensing, perform signal process circuitry, you know, for signal processing and perform Bluetooth based on wireless communication. We made a, you know, a different type of nanomaterial material with jointly, the jointly enhanced the efficiency of this biofuel cell. They can get 3.6 up to milliwatt per centimeter square from sweat continuously. So it's very high power, and we also improve the stability in the particles, and uh, we encapsulate the system, you know, with PMS, attach this at different body parts again to perform battery free analysis. You can get in sweat, urea, ammonia, glucose, pH, again, without using any battery. And in collaboration with the Adenic Mandy, another professor of electrical engineering, actually the chair of electrical engineering at Caltech, we developed this integrated IC chip. The fully packed system is very small, as you can see here. They can still efficiently harvest energy and provide stable power output and perform wireless communication. So we could also power our wearables with body motions through a triple electrical nano generator. In this case, we are using a flexible PCB based one, it's very robust. We convert the mechanical motion into electricity as well to realize better increases. But again, biofuel cell can provide a higher power than TNG. So in summary, uh, we have presented uh, you know, this wearable platform that can be used to collect a large set of chemical information continuously, non-invasively from the skin. And we think the large set of chemical information can be used for many new fundamental and clinical investigations. At the end, I will thank my wonderful research group <coughs> and our cooperation on technology development and uh, clinical evaluations. And finally, our funding support. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tom, for this interesting talk. So we can take two quick questions if you have, yeah, please. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. My question is about, uh, you've shown a um, this, uh, human machine interface uh, uh, using fingerprint sensors. Yes. So you have developed your own sense, I mean, own links. I'm just a bit curious about, it's all the multifunctional links printed on the same sub substrate. That's right. Has it been as a multi cartridge printed on the same, the same simultaneously? Uh, we didn't do simultaneously, one layer by one layer. Oh. Yeah. But we use you know, one material, one cartridge. So, but it's fully printed. We don't do any manual modification. Okay. Yeah. But, but each component in the sensing sensor, I think, has multiple functions. That's, That's right. Uh, I mean, for the, each sensing electrode can be based on different materials, right? Each sensing electrode can be a multiple layer, like carbon, sensing material, oh. yeah, it's just like this. Like you do with the, like symptom evaporation, you layer by layer. Oh, you will do it. Yeah. Very important. Thank you. Yeah, um, so I have a one about durability of the device when they're on the skin. Um, how uh, do you envision, how long do you envision these things staying on the skin? Do you envision these things staying on the skin for like, a, is it a multiple? Is there multiple days, weeks, or is it really a one day application? Sort of? I think from a sensing point of view, we want to make our sensor multiple sensor at least uh, and after a week. But in practical, you know, we don't have to use it for a week. For example, if I have a water check every day, right? Our mm. house, at least it can be for daily use, and we hope it will be multiple days. But overall, one of the reasons we want to make this large 
scale mass production because one makes sense of hex very low cost. In this case, whenever you charge your watch or wristband, you can peel the layer, the extension layer off, put the new one on, use it. Okay, let us thank our speaker again.